The ground cracked like the rough pit of a peach and snapped in two. The sun behind the mountains turned into an olive green glow. To Nina Gloria, this was home. She continued to sell her bowl of lemons, rubbing a cold, thin silver Christ pocketed in her apron. Others, like Lito and Marvin, placed soldiers in the ruins of a school, running around mounds of bricks, shooting chickens and pigs. No one knows exactly how a live film of ash appear on everyone's eyelids early in the morning, or how trout and mackerel plunged from the sky, twitched, leaped to the streets. Some say the skin of trees fell like old newspaper, dry and yellow. Others believe the subsets washed aside in rivers began to rise in their milk. One Monday morning, a rain fell, and the cemetery washed into the city. Bones began to knock and knock at our doors. Streets became muddy rivers, waiting for bodies to drop among piles of dead fish. In a year, everyone stabbed flowers on a grave. This explains why women thought and moved like lizards under stones, why men heard bees buzzing inside their skulls, why dogs lost their sense of smell, sniffing piles of rubble to get back home. In a few years, no one cared about turtles banging their heads against rocks, bulls with their sad, busted eyes, parrots that kept diving into creeks, the dark swelling of the open ground, or at night, a knife stained the kitchen cloth. Instead, Nina Gloria swept the ground, the broom licking her feet at each stroke. At the bus station, Marvin shined military boots, 25 cents a pair, reduced his words to a spit, a splutter of broken sentences on shoe polish leather. In the evenings, he counted coins he tossed in a jar, then walked home, one step closer to the cracked bone clenched in the yellow jaw of a dog. I'm originally from El Salvador. Um, I came to uh, the United States in 1980. Um, my family was escaping a war um, uh, that tore the country apart. It lasted for about 12 years. In 1992, a peace treaty was signed, and I decided to go back with the idea that I was going to find my homeland. And um, of course, when I got there, I found out that El Salvador had changed, and I had changed. And I felt like a stranger in a strange land. I didn't feel like I fit in. And so I came back to California and, and lived, between, uh, lived in, uh, between San Francisco and LA for a couple of years and began to have these feelings of exile. And I began to write. Um, and of course, when I was writing, I wasn't thinking I was going to become a writer or, or a poet. Um, but I began to write and I began to realize that home was neither here nor there. It wasn't in L.A. or San Francisco or, or um, El Salvador. Um, but I realized that as I was write, writing that I was, that I was looking for a homeland. And of course, the homeland that I found was in the words that I was putting together. The sentences, the poems themselves became my homeland, which is why I opened my book with um, a quote from the uh, uh, Polish poet uh, Szesla Miloc, language is the only homeland. As I punch the time clock, I know men will be gone down at dawn in a distant continent. Someone will dart into a cafe with the bomb nestled in the belly. By the roadside, a woman will moan over the body of a man shrunken, stretched on the earth, 
that God will finger the forehead of a dying country. All of it funnel through the news on TV. But tonight, instead of tuning in, I'm going to kneel beside the window, recognize myself in the crook of the crow, high above the black tree of winter, claws hooked and rough, wings swept back and hunched, face masked with exhaust. I'm going to try, even if I fail, to see myself whole, complete in the cry, in the beak of the crow. I'm going to read a Coltrane poem. And the, the first time I listened to uh, Coltrane, I felt like it was a, a kind, there was a kind of freedom in the plane. And I, I did not know then, uh, but for me, after the war, um, listening to Coltrane was sort of a healing experience. It, it felt like, like, like the world was being restored again for myself. And um, it's, it's, it's a poem where I try to approach the poem the way that Coltrane approaches a poem which um, has to do with improvisation and the way that he would approach uh, uh, a piece of music was that it would take a long time to get it all in. Um, he, he played very long, he had long solos, almost like half an hour playing a solo, as opposed to Miles Davis who would think of what can I leave out of the song. So in a, in a way, it kind of reminded me of Whitman and Dickinson, you know, with Whitman going on for a long time, very operatic, you know, very long poems, and then Dickinson writing very short poems. On first listening to Coltrane, I loved them. The full body wail of a tenor, large and round, his crook fingers on brass, choking the hollow horn with God cut in his throat, the way he pushed a mountain into his saxophone. It hit me. Like a hundred iron wheels steamed down the tracks, cold driven, rolling solid to the tongue of night, darker than tar, grinding thoughts into sounds, gush of phrases that spiral forward, climb the tip of the way about to uncurl, spiral back plunge and collapse into this note, blessed and obsessed, perfect in the palm of my hand, touched by the earth, wet and small, dust and bones, the heavy weight of corn, the wind that comes wrapped in fish and salt, the cry of the crow high above the road where he stands spindly as a tree, the symbol splash of sunlight, the horn blaring. You think he's cracking a branch, hooked in the river, green and growing, leaves scaried with the current, twirling, black and swirling, bobbing along the line he plays, plays again until the branch finally snaps, the driftwood swelling along the bank, waves reflecting the bed of rock, and then rain, the falling pins of rain the river that runs to the shore. Next, next poem is called Guayaveras. It's, um, it's a tropical shirt. It's very common in LA. Um, I usually wear one, um, but it's too cold to wear one today. Um, uh, it's the, uh, the New Yorkian poet, Victor Hernandez Cruz, calls the Guayavera the tuxedo of the Caribbean. And I think he's right, it's a very elegant shirt. And I think uh, Whitman would probably look very nice in the way of it. I'm sure of it. I'm sure he's wearing one right now in poetry heaven. Guayaveras. In my boyhood, all the men wore them. A light body shirt with pleats running down the breast. Two top pockets for pens, no pants. Two bottom ones for keys or loose change. Each swan with a button in the middle of the pouch, a compliment tailored to the slit at the side of the hip. 
If you look at photographs in family albums, men stand against palm trees, their short sleeve guayaveras cut in sunlight, their Panama hats tipped to the sky. There's a black and white of my father stumbling along fields of cane, head full of rum, mouth in an O, probably singing a bolero of old San Juan. On days like this, the sun burned like an onion in oil. Women hung guayaveras on windows to dry. Shirtless, men picked up their barefoot babies off the floor, held them against their bellies as if talking to a god. Even my school uniform was a blue guayavera. But nothing like my father's favorite, white, long sleeve, above the left breast, a tiny pocket, perfectly slender for a cigar, arabesque designs vertically stretched. When the evening breeze lulled from tree to tree, he serenaded my mother, guitars and tongs of rum below her balcony, the trio strumming, plucking till one in the morning. I don't know what came first, war or years of exile, but everyone, shakers of maracas, cutters of cane, rollers of tobacco, stop wearing them, hung them back in the closet, waiting for the children to grow, an arc of Paris to fly across the sky at five in the evening. In another country, fathers in the silver hair sit on their porches, their sons now men hold babies in the air, guayaveras nicely pressed. I had a strong fascination with pigs um, since my childhood because my, my grandmother used to take me to the slaughterhouse. And I used to get to see all these pigs just kind of slapping around in the mud. And um, sometimes my mom would take me uh, to see her family uh, who live in the outskirts, in the mountains, and the pigs were everywhere. And um, they were very stubborn. They wouldn't get out of the way. And they would just kind of walk in and out of the houses. And sometimes you had to like chase them away and slap them in the behind, and sometimes they chase you back. They were very, very stubborn. It almost, almost, when I think of it now, I almost felt like a relative who was always around. Um, I would like to dedicate this poem to the, uh, the barefoot children I met in the streets of El Sabler. Bury this pig. Behind the cornfield, we scaled the mountainside, looking for a foothold among the cracks, rooting out weeds, trampling on trash. The trek, as if it were a holy crusade, Bodies armor mounted on horses, banners fluttering in the air. Then one morning, we stumble upon the thing, dead, cramped in a ditch, covered in ants, trotters grimy, a purple snout of flies, and not a dollop of blood, but a thick piece of hide cradling about 50 pounds of hog. Someone said, kush, kush, as if to awaken the thing. I thought about the carcass, blood slick, staggering into the room, grumbling and drowning as if deep in the mud, eyes buckled in fear, bones breaking down to the ground, open to the chop and tear of human hands, pork and lard. Four feet, fat back cut into slabs, an organ fattened butcher. It continued for weeks. A few of us meeting in the afternoons just to look at the steaming belly, maggots stealing the gray of the brain. Each time 
one more barefoot boy probing the eye socket with a stick. Some of us came back armed with picks and bars, shovels dusty in our hands, until the ground groaned with war, the sky fell and cracked the earth. How was I to know? They would be hooked, hacked, snouts smashed on the wall, their bodies coarse screws on the floor. How was I to know I would bury this pig rock after rock? Thank you for listening and thank you for coming.